in Ghent. So I uh, have to say thank you to her afterwards, but thanks a lot to our local hosts. And yeah, I enjoy the day. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Nadja, for uh, giving us the context of this workshop. Now let's go to our keynote. Uh, keynote of today is uh, Dr. Erik Mannens. He is a research unit leader of the Future Media and Ima uh, Imaging Department at iMinds, uh, a Ghent University um, uh, department. Now he managed uh, several, uh, many, many projects uh, until now. Uh, he gained his a PhD degree in computer science engineering and his major expertise is centered around metadata modeling very important for us, semantic web technologies, broadcasting workflows, IDTV, and uh, web development in general. Um, and he's also a co-chair of the W3C Media Fragments Working Group and actively participating in other W3C semantic web standardization activities. Um, he also recently co-founded the Belgian chapter of the Open Knowledge Foundation. So Eric, please, I give the floor to you. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, just to set the scene, I have uh, four slides on myself. Um, the first one is uh, the web, okay, it's about 22 years old, and I worked on with the web for, uh, for 19 years. Now, um, I know my wife 15 years, so I have a longer relationship with uh, the web than uh, with my wife. And every day I spend more time on the web than with my wife. For the rest, um, there's nothing similar. Uh, that for the rest, they are quite similar, right? They're complex, uh, high maintainability, and I cannot uh, live it out for uh, every day without the web. Right. Now, the second thing you have to know about me is that um, I adhere to standards. We all have to adhere to standards, and so does, uh, does the web. Without uh, standards on the web, um, well, there should be uh, only less uh, or not a lot of uh, interoperability on it, right? And the standards, I also adhere to open standards, uh, open air, open. Uh, that's why I uh, actively participate in W3C and not MPEG, right? I really want open standards. And the last one, that's my research. Uh, I'm very into semantics. Uh, Primarily the W3C stack, so everything that has to do with uh, the semantic web. So uh, on this one, if my computer was a dog, uh, my dog, uh, my computer would understand garbage collection. No, that's a difficult one. Anyone? Okay, I can tell my wife there were no nerds in the room. I was the only one that got this one on garbage collection. All right. Now, Inge asked me to do a keynote on open science. So I started out thinking, um, uh, by the way, it's my first keynote, so I do not know how I'm doing, but uh, uh, fine. Um, I, will, I will enjoy it. Uh, it's maybe my last keynote, right? Um, so the first thing that came into my mind is on open science is uh, open data. Now, um, only half a decade ago, uh, primarily and in, in, in government institution, uh, they wondered why um, there were all kinds of silos of data out there and we already paid for it and it's not reusable because it's not open, right? So Tim Berners-Lee was the first to say that we should stop hugging our data and really make it open. So now a side note, there will be a couple of times that you see that slide again, all right? So I learned something from the social sciences. Um, whatever I say something important, it sticks better if you have um, something active, actively doing. So whenever you see that slide, you hug your neighbor, all right? Not this time, the next time. So Tim Merlis Lee said we should make it open all data should be open so it is, uh, we could reuse it uh, for whatever purposes and get extra knowledge. So that about open. And then there's the semantic web, uh, my area of expertise. And this was primarily uh, used uh, within the research um, 
area. And uh, okay, we can infer knowledge, new knowledge out of existing knowledge and machines can do it for us, right? Now, the problem with both the open data um, area and the semantic web area is that there was not uh, one killing or killer use case. And then came along the linked open data paradigm. And for this one, we now, for both the open data and the semantic web, we have a killer application, namely linked open data. Um, I was there when uh, the linked open data movement was, uh, was found back in 2008 in uh, WWW uh, Beijing. Uh, and at this first ALDO workshop, they only had, uh, let's say, 25 linked data sets. Now, this is the image in 2010, and since then they just stopped making that image because now this image is far, far, far too big because there's an uh, already an immense uh, linked open data cloud uh, out there in different areas, also in, in, in library uh, stuff, but in all sorts of, of, of sciences. So we have a paradigm to connect our silos now. Um, have to arise, do it via HTTP, um, have extra knowledge via RDF, and then see that you can interlink it. Right? These are the simple four principles of linked open data. Now, my two humble cents on open data. Thou shall know your data, librarians. What you should do is make all the scientists aware that they, before they hand out the data to you, that they understand all their data sets, how it's collected, generated, all stuff like that, that, of course, 80% of, over 80% of the time is time spent on cleaning their data. So all the things they can do, you do not have to do anymore. And most importantly, um, also in the linked open data movement and, and beyond, as we will see uh, later on in the Read Write Web, you have to make sure that you get all this missing metadata. And in this one, the provenance and versioning is very, very important. Because uh, as scientists, how could you redo your experiment? Uh, so this is information you need um, to disclose to. In the end, um, hopefully uh, in the not so far future, data should be a commodity, right? As this Fort T was uh, in the early 1900s, being the commodity for uh, for the every everybody's uh, every day's car, right? Instead of a faster horse. So, first thing you should embrace open data. I'm gonna do that, ah, and you too. <laughs> every time. Ah, one embrace open data. Now, the second thing I came across, if I had to think about uh, open science, is. Uh, it's uh, open software, right? So what if all people should be equal? What if all scientists have the same uh, tools that they could use? What if um, you have a domain expert who wants to work on some tool to augment it and to, um, to make it better? Then he could maybe give it back to the community so other researchers can use it. So I'm for one, and the rest of my team are really believers of, uh, of open source. So, small side note, and this is uh, the technical part of my presentation. I will briefly talk about two open source projects that uh, my team is, uh, is working on. And the first one, the data tank, together with um, the Library of Gans uh, Kathmandu project. Uh, this will be a workshop later, later this week that two of my people um, together with Patrick from uh, Ghent University will lead, right? So what is the data tank about? Uh, in fact, it's a 15 minutes open data publishing framework. It's already used um, in Flanders quite extensively, uh, a few cities uh, and the Hippolis and a few um, other organizations use it. Um, and there we publish according to this uh, linked open data five star principle of uh, Tim Berners-Lee. So we start from two stars and we can go up to uh, five stars. And the thing is, in fact, what we, um, the bottom line is that we end up with a RESTful API for developers. So um, whatever comes in, if, if it's CSV, XLS, JSON, we can 
put out also whatever you want, even uh, we also have a semantic version of it. But uh, bottom line is 15 minutes publishing open data and you get the RESTful API so you can easily reuse it in your applications. Now, uh, the next step, what we are working on right now and what we um, published just two weeks ago at uh, the last WWW conference and got great response is raw base. Uh, you, s you spell it raw base or you read it as raw base, but it's read and write base. It's kind of a git for triples. Because the next thing on linked data, it's the read write web. Uh, for the moment, you only read stuff and you interlink it, but we want to have a complete read write web. Now, in the before you can write, uh, you have to think of, of course, ownership, provenance, versioning, and are the current uh, triple stores uh, up to up to it? I don't think so. So we came up with uh, with a solution. Uh, we have a um, complete distributed triple version uh, control system uh, as a hit. So whatever we commit something, uh, it is stored as a delta, but it's described as a virtual graph, and this virtual graph identifies some version, and the version resolves the delta. It's as simple as that. Of course, we also want to have a um, huge amount of triples, and we want it stream, so we need a lightweight algorithm um, to do so. Um, this is a slide that I recovered from one of, one of my peers. And all the other images I have are, s are really something, images that relate to the stuff. Now I see three children, I have to ask why it relates to triples or lightweight, and what are they looking at, the algorithm? Okay, I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, so you s we store the triples at, uh, as quads, so you have normal triples as subject, predicate, object, and the versioning, we uh, store that as context. Um, very simple, all the adds we have have odd numbers, 0, 2, um, no, even numbers, 0, 2, 4, and if we delete something, you, ha you give it an odd number, 1, 3, 5, right? So that's um, simply said what's behind it. So in, in the end, uh, raw base provides a version control for triple stores with direct provenance, and provenance uh, for you is very important, and direct graph access. So again, my two humble sense on this one, on open source, is that thou shalt provide tooling and make the scientists aware of that there's probably a lot of uh, things out there um, and you have to consider security and privacy and most important, um, as I worked with a lot of organizations, is that even if you use open source, see that you have an IT partner that knows how to handle it within your organization. In the end, hug open source too. I just love Inge. <laughs> now, we had open data, open source. What about open research? Um, there, um, so I worked in industry for uh, 15 years, and then I came to IMITES, worked uh, within the engineering department, but from the first day, I also worked with other scientists, like the social scientists or the gamma scientists, and what I directly mm -hmm. saw is that we should not stick within our own um, vertical thing, like I'm a data researcher, so I'm probably best at statistics, but there's a data creative from a social scientist who's probably better in analyzing uh, big data or doing maths. So um, we become smarter if we learn from the other scientists. So for me, um, if you do science, it should be by default interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Now, um, as an example, we have the Large Hadron Collider in, in CERN. I just took here an image. It looks like uh, a Large Hadron Collider. I don't know if it is, but for let's, let's assume it is. It's large, and you can probably collide something, right? Okay, there's a, a Large Hadron Collider in CERN, um, which produces a fast amount of data, uh, millions or trillions of particles colliding, all uh, having data, and 
they were not able to uh, analyze it themselves. So they had, uh, they formed a consortium, the Open Science Grid, and wherever there's a supercomputer um, somewhere in the world, they can get some data and process it. Now what happened? That some supercomputer in, uh, in San Diego, without even knowing, found the Higgs boson. Right? So they just analyze stuff, and then all of a sudden, the Higgs boson is this uh, red arrow. So it's just find the red arrow. It's simple, right? Not rocket science. So they found it. Now, my two humble cents on open research uh, in two slides, prepare to hug. Thou shall be the catalysts of all the different science. Uh, sort of science you have out there, huh? the alpha, beta, gamma sciences, if they uh, publish in the right way and you librarians, you, um, you are the catalyst to getting all this data out there, maybe um, there will be, uh, it will be easier for scientists to get out of their comfort zone and try to work more interdisciplinary. So cherish open research. It's only me. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Open access. That's probably the, the most important one for you. I only have one slide, and then it's already a hook again. I only have one slide on open access. It's my personal view. Tear down that paywall. Because for all research, uh, primarily in, in universities, it's already paid for, so why do we have to uh, pay an extra to have this Springer or whatever? So I'm all for open access, but not only the papers, no, also accompanying data, also the algorithms, also uh, a plan of how they use the algorithm together with the data to become uh, all, um, all that is written down in the paper, so somebody else can really, in an easy way, redo your stuff and see if it, if it was correct. So my humble two cents on open access is embrace open access by default. Now, um, what I just heard yesterday, um, I was only preparing this, <laughs> this slide set this night, <laughs> um, is that, okay, before you can, you can open up as a, as a, as a library uh, both the, the PDFs and the data itself and um, all accompanying metadata, it seems that you have to have an end-to-end -end metadata workflow in place. Otherwise, you have to deal with all the, uh, the inconsequences uh, by yourself. So at least have your authors and organizations, uh, what's uh, on the bottom, uh, bottom uh, on, on, on the front page of, of your PDFs, have it rigidly formalized and formalize it as soon as possible, so at the source, so you don't have to bother uh, with it anymore. But love open access. <laughs> so we had open data or I thought about open software, open research, and open access. So for me, that's open science. But only specifically for um, me as within my own domain, right? So if we link all these different open sciences, then we get linked open science, and that, for me, is open knowledge. Now, two extras. Once we have open knowledge, you, there should be a, um, um, a feedback channel, so we can go, where we can go to uh, open learning. I have uh, three little examples of it. What about this massive online uh, open course of MIT and Stanford? Uh, millions of open courses. Now, if one way or another we could also relate that to everything you as librarians put out in the open. Right? That's not, for the moment, it's not happening, but what if? And the second thing, uh, I heard um, 
this guy, Louis van Aan from Guatemala. Um, he got rich by selling his uh, CAPTCHA software to, uh, to Google, and then he did nothing and thought, what can I do for humanity? And he came up with Duolingo. What is it? It's a complete free tool to learn languages, but as you learn the language, the exercises you get are parts of um, or OCR books that they really do not know what it means, or it's kind of a Wikipedia. So um, it's completely free, but while you learn, you, um, you translate other books automatically. And of course, behind the scenes, there will be some algorithms to check if uh, already five people did it the same way. Okay, this is the real translation. But it's already open and free, and at the same time, it adds more knowledge openly back to the community. That for me, that's unbelievable. Uh, this is how it should be. I do not know how this slide came about, but every time I give a presentation, this slide pops in. It's our, it's my team's uh, neatest, um, how you call it, uh, demo of what we can do with um, with linked open data. We will put it open. And if you try it at home uh, later tonight, it's, it's fun. Uh, you log in with your Facebook, and then uh, you will see. You will see something really interesting. So you will learn. It's not open yet, but you will learn. All right. My second extra, it's about open ranking. Right. So we have all these open ranking, uh, university rankings. Uh, are they objective? I do not know. Every year uh, from Thompson, I get um, a document that I have to fill in. What do you think uh, in your area are the best researcher? What is the best team you work with? That's not objective. So I met a guy from um, Sydney University, and he wanted to see if he could make a ranking based on the linked open data cloud as it is right now. So he. Um, he got some from the open, uh, linked open data cloud. He got some uh, features that he said, well, okay, let's, let's see what I can get out if I take these features, uh, this feature list, and see what ranking uh, I can come up with. So a uh, doctoral student, um, who is the author of a publication, was it notable work, what is the alma mater employee of some application? And uh, he made a kind of uh, a waiting system. And um, there were also ins and outs, uh, so he knew where he could go further uh, down, down the line. Now he came up with this. Uh, so his ranking, it's the, the pick score. And then you see the major ones, uh, OS. And you see that, well, it's not the same, but um, it, it might be a better ranking in the end, a more objective ranking than what we have so far, right? And now this is just research. He will put it out openly and then uh, probably adjust the weighting factors. Eh? There is no Belgian university in the top 100 of the open ranking. I could end with this one, eh? with this bombshell, do something, make more open data out there so we get up there very quickly, right? So I will not end. So we have open data, open software, open research, open access, open science. Is that is that good? This is better, right? We, we, we should not talk about open, open. This should be default. Data, software, research, access, that's science. Everything should be open by default. Love open, period. All well, right, about time. Okay, I'm Eric. <coughs> yeah, we kept the schedule. Thank you hey. very, very much. Uh, is, do you have questions? <laughs>